got three sessions for you today. Firstly, we have some information about the range of wellbeing resources and tools that are available to you, your teams and colleagues. We're then going to take a five minute time out for some personal restorative practice. Um, I'm going to be leading that, you lucky people. And then finally, we're going to have some information about the AHP Health and Work Report and how you might use this to support people of working age who use your services. But before we kick off, um, in readiness for our first presentation, we've got a couple of Mentimeter questions that I would, last, I would like to ask you to, to complete. So, Lauren, can I ask you to put the first Mentimeter question up? So brilliant. We'll give that another minute or so. You can see that we've um, we've got quite a few folk who've just joined us in the last couple of minutes. So for those of you who have just come online, uh, what we're currently doing is in readiness for our first speaker, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, we're just focusing on a couple of Mentimeter questions to get us thinking about um, our own workplace well-being. It's so lovely to see all of that, all of that good practice in there about relaxation and reflection and walking and swimming and dancing. There's nothing better than having a good dance to, to make you feel a bit better. And taking time out and spending time with family and friends. That's brilliant. So I think all of those responses can continue. So what we might do is move on to the second question, if you will, Lauren. Interesting, there's a lot, there's a lot in there around time. There's a lot of, uh, there around having the support of line managers by the sounds of things. There's, there's a lot there that kind of says a little bit of information, some of the resources, but actually maybe a little bit of encouragement. That's really interesting. Fabulous. Keep those, keep those uh, responses coming through. They're really, really helpful. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm now going to um, I have the very great pleasure to introduce Claire Smith. Claire is a Workforce Program Manager with Health Education Improvement Wales and has taken the lead around workplace wellbeing over the last couple of years. Um, so today she's going to explore some of the tools and resources that are currently available uh, to you. So Claire, can I hand over to you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and oh, those those answers to those questions are great. I'm hoping that I'll, I'll get them um, at the end because they'll help inform some of our work going forward. But I'll I'll pick up on on some of them as we go as well. <coughs> so Pranamda Paub, Claire Smith Adui, a ready ready be woody board in Guaisio many yesterday's the Guaisli now. I'm Chaim Lanez, I can arrange chair Sam Egan Lanez. So good afternoon, everyone, and Claire Smith. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Wendy. And I've been working in the field of colleague health and wellbeing now for six years and in the NHS for over 21 years in, in a corporate workforce role. I really appreciate the opportunity that you've given me to come here today to tell you about the resources that are available. So there are um, five slides. Um, well, six of you include this one. It's a 10 minute presentation. And then I'll, I've got 10 minutes for questions <clears throat> at the end. If you wanted to put the questions in the chat bar, we can pick them up as uh, at the end as well. So if we could move on to slide two, please. So I just wanted to take you back to the evidence, first of all. So there is now and has been over the last 10 years, some real growing credible evidence of the importance of health and wellbeing of the workforce, and that includes our students and our volunteers, and um, also about the health and wellbeing of the system as a whole. And the key to wellbeing is engagement, and engagement is closely linked to the individual's relationship with their organisation, and more importantly, their immediate team and their line manager. And that was really interesting what came up in the Mentimeter, a lot of uh, comments around um, approval and line management support and and uh, uh, blessings to spend time on 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 oneself's well-being. 
So engagement and well-being are interconnected and these factors are positively correlated with a number of highly desirable organisational outcomes. What that effectively means is healthy workforce equates to healthier patients in simple terms. So I've got some links in the slide there. I'm happy for the slides to be shared. And that will take those links will take you to the actual evidence and report behind this, which says clearly that um, better quality of staff's experience, the way they're treated uh, compassionately with respect, the better the quality of care for the patients the better outcome for the patient, readmittance back into hospital and good HRM practices. So the processes within an organisation are important to create the right culture for well-being um, to thrive. So these are really important issues. It's not just a, a nice to have to be a good employer. Retention is so important at the moment. And, and will be for some years to come. So it's really important that we look after the staff we've got. Um, and the majority of the staff we've got, we're actually going to have in 10 years' time. So let's make sure that the, the staff in 10 years' time are, are well and we've supported them to stay well. If I can ask for slide three, please. Thank you. So uh, the key to the conditions which are laid out in the Healthier, Healthier Wales plan is that organisations understand that relationship between well-being and engagement. And it is a complex system. It's, it's not linear. But the circle there um, just shows how well-being affects the individual. So it's the relationship with their line manager, the relationship with their peers, the overall department and organisation, and also the makeup of their job. And I could, I'll go into more detail about that later as well. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Maslow triangle of a hierarchy of needs, but basically what it says is the psychological needs at the bottom um, are around air, food, drink, shelter, clo clothing, warmth, sleep. But it's also around um, safety. So the safety needs, um, does an individual feel psychologically safe um, in, in the job that they do? And I know this has been a particular um, impact through COVID where staff are, are redeployed into areas where they're unfamiliar and um, maybe they feel that um, they need further training or they, you know, they need to refresh their competency. So actually feeling safe in your role is very important. Belonging and love, that's so important as well. And with COVID, with us being isolated and some of us working from home, it's so important that we spend time nurturing our relationships with our colleagues. And then uh, esteem, so it's classified as two categories, one self and that's dignity, achievement, and the other one is reputation and status. And these are really important factors in any kind of job as well as as the workplace so self-actualization and that re refers to the person's own potential and their self-fulfillment and we may have experienced through covid a heightened effect of this of staff that have been placed in different positions and are actually recognizing um a different kind of difference that they can make. So there's positives and negatives that have, will have come out of COVID. And then there's another one called PIES, which is used by the military. And it means proximity, immediacy, expectancy and simplicity. And I think that is, is well placed in areas where there is a crisis. So at the beginning of COVID, um, it, it was one of the things that I put in my strategy and proximity just means redeploying them into roles that make a difference, but also still having the clear line with their line manager so that their normal communication lines might have broken down, but their new ones are established. Immediacy, and that means only putting the people in that area for the shorter time as possible. So once they've, the immediacy is, is passed, 
bring them back out and, and give them some rest. And that's not always possible in the NHS. Like it's like in, in, in the military, they go off on um, missions and then they come back. Um, in the NHS, we are finding that staff have been doing this now for two years with no break. So in those times, it's important to keep it simple. And that's the S of the pies. And that is focus on a good night's sleep. Have they had a break? And I and I laugh there because I know that's one of the one of the biggest um, pressures. Have they had a break? Have they rested? Have they had a drink? Have they had time to go to the toilet? And have they had some food? So when it is really really pressured, just just keep it simple. Thank you. Slide four. So that was just some of the theory behind um, the environment. So this is. I wanted to give some context to what's happening in NHS Wales. And what you'll see there is a very busy slide, but each of the areas has a link and it will take you to the report. So we've got the Our, Our Workforce Strategy for Health and Social Care. We've got the Healthier Wales Plan, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and the Social Service, Services and Wellbeing Act and then all the compassionate leadership principles that you see there. And what that basically means is all these areas are working together to create that culture. Um, we've got healthy working relationships, staff survey, and we've got the managing attendance at work policy, which is currently under review. So if you wanted to, if you're a reflector or a theorist and you wanted to look, look at this in more detail, you can do that. Um, after. So what I wanted to say, just give you a very short story of, of what happened during COVID. So the Staff Health and Wellbeing subgroup was set up, which was a subgroup of the workforce cell, and it was established to respond at pace to the changing workforce challenges that COVID-19 was creating. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to underpin it with the compassionate leadership principles and we had lots of bullet points, but I've, I've, I'm keeping them brief. We review best practice from elsewhere and adopt where possible. Build on the work already been undertaken with Welsh Government, such as the expansion of Health for Health professionals, and explore and procure where appropriate priority access solutions. So the group grew very quickly and we had representation from across NHS Wales, including the social care workforce, Welsh Government and trade unions, and we met weekly. And within the first 10 days, working days, we were able to provide a playlist of resources and access to health board sites for staff to access as a one stop shop that has now grown significantly since and is now available in a website, which is also on the slide. We were able to grow so quickly and at such pace because we've had a health and wellbeing network for the last six years, which is made up of professionals from across NHS Wales who lead on health and wellbeing, occupational health and managing attendance of work in the workplace. So I, we were able to gather ourselves together quite quickly and be able to come up with, with this resource. What we're currently doing at the moment, the network still meets every six weeks. And the things that we're, we're concentrating on going forward is raising awareness of what's available, hence my attendance here today, monitoring what resources are being used, which is why I moved to the website. So we have website analytics and I attend national meetings for NHS England, NHS Improvement, NHS Employers to see if there are any gaps in the Wales offer. We're currently looking at two pilots. We're scoping out um, how peer support, um, a peer support pilot, which is led by Dr. Adrian Neal, clinical psychologist in an Iron Bevan and Professor Richard Williams from Cardiff Metropolitan University. So we're hoping that that will begin now in February and that will um, look at how peer support can work within the workplace to support health and wellbeing. And we're also working with the Arts Council of Wales on a number of different projects on how they can support staff wellbeing. So as I said, I've been program managing this network now for the last six years and um, the Managing Attendance at Work Project Group, that's the group that developed the policy 
and we are now reviewing that policy. We've got a couple of key documents which I'll refer to from the network, our wellbeing matters, our manager wellbeing matters. And we also worked with an external company on reviewing the occupational health resource for NHS Wales. So the reason we meet, we want to share best practice from across the health boards. We want to reduce duplication of activities where we can do a once for Wales approach. And uh, we want to share from each other's learning. And we just want to break down those, those barriers um, so that there's more equity of access to resources um, across Wales. So if I can move on to our last slide now, that's slide six. Um, so this is a plan on the page. This is what we did as a group. Um, it's just a, just a one page synopsis of all the things that we developed at the beginning of COVID that have now been put onto the website. Um, and then the final slide, please. So again, it's, it's all the support that's available in a, in a, so the pyramid on the right hand side. Basically what we're saying is the most important thing is that you look at your own well-being and prioritise that where you can work out what's important to you and how to access any resources that you need. Then the second part is support from your colleagues. Um, and I talked about the peer support pilot, which we're looking at. The next one, then the green area of the pyramid is organisation. And I can't emphasise enough how much fantastic work is going on in the health boards. And that would be my advice your first port of call would be to go to your local health board wellbeing pages because you'll find so many free resources there. But this is a national resource that I'm promoting here today, which will signpost to um, national resources as well. And if I can um, ask you to look at the emotional and physical wellbeing decision trees when you, when you have time, because that will take you through a series of questions which will be able to support you individually to the necessary resources. But basically, this page that I'm showing here is all the resources that are on the website. So from the lower end of the spectrum, right up to the crisis intervention. And then there's three resources I just want to bring your attention to. And that is all Wales resources. So we've got Health for Health Professionals. That's free, a free resource for all healthcare staff, and that is now going to be extended to social care staff as well. They're open from nine to five, and they they offer six sessions of CBT free with an accredited uh, therapist. They've got a self-help mobile app, guides and platforms. The other one then is the Samaritans. That was a dedicated line that was set up at the beginning of COVID. It's bilingual. It's open 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. in English and 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. in Welsh. That's a dedicated health and social care helpline with um, trained Samaritan volunteers who understand the pressures of this particular environment. And then thirdly is Silver Cloud. And Silver Cloud is a online cognitive behaviour therapy that is free to health staff. The link is on there for you to access and that is a full service that's been provided by the Welsh Government, excuse me, <clears throat> and it has specific programmes around anxiety, the five different anxiety programmes available, depression, COVID-19, panic, phobia and OCD. So that's the whistle stop tour of um, the resources that are available. Um, I've got time now for questions. So I don't know how you want to manage the questions. Wendy, hands up or um, or in the chat bar. I don't mind. Absolutely. We um, we haven't yet had any questions posted in the chat bar. If um, if you'd like to take questions from hands up to start with, then that would be great. And if anybody thinks of anything while the discussion continues, then they can can add those to the, the chat bar there thereafter, perhaps. Thank you, Claire. I think this is just 
such an amazing piece of work. And while people are thinking about their questions, I guess I was just um, wanted to make a comment about how wonderful it is that um, the resources that are being made available are being offered to the workforce across the whole of the health and care system. I think that this is something that, you know, um, certainly in the media we see that there's a lot of focus on the NHS, don't we? There's not always recognition about the challenges faced by some of our colleagues out there um, in in social care and in the community teams. What I, what I was going to say, one of the as I'm waiting for the question, um, a, com a couple of the things that came up in, in the Mentimeter responses, um, I saw from the first question that they very clearly link to the five ways to well-being, and new economics is, has evidenced the five ways to well-being. I've got an action plan, which I'm happy for Lauren to share with the group, which can be used uh, as an individual. So you've got your action plan at the end and it takes you through the five ways to well-being. So the five ways to well-being would include things like connecting, learning, physical activity, uh, taking notice, time in nature. And there's some suggestions in that action plan of how you do that and how you factor them into your life. Um, so that's available. But there's also a more detailed one. So if you're a line manager and you wanted to have a facilitated conversation with your team uh, as a team event or as an individual, there is a, a set of questions which takes you through things like demand, workload, autonomy, belonging, relationships. And um, it's a self-scoring exercise. And then at the end, then you can work with your team to develop their own personal uh, well-being action plan. The other tool that was launched just before Christmas as well by the Welsh Government is the Wellbeing Conversation Guide and that's available on ESR and for our social care colleagues on At Learning Wales and it's an e-learning programme. It's, 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 it's not too lengthy or complicated. Uh, it's quite a, quite a fun one. I can say that because it wasn't developed by myself. Uh, it was developed by uh, colleagues from the network. And that is a guide to having a conversation. It doesn't have to wait for a PADR. You can have that at your one-to-ones. You can have it at your team briefings. You can have it while you're going for a walk or having a cup of coffee. But what it's actually doing is, is you're showing um, your colleagues that it's important and it's a priority and it's something that they should be prioritizing. So it's good role modeling. Um, and also, I know working from home and at strategic levels within health boards, we don't always prioritise ourselves. I think we're in healthcare for a reason, and that is because we are empathetic and we are givers. And I think that, you know, it's important that we we play that back to ourselves as well so that we're in the best position we can be to provide that care. Um, I'm happy to do individual sessions with anybody. I'm a qualified coach. I'm on the Acad um, Academy Wales website. And um, if anybody wants any further information, I'm just happy to, to provide it. Thank you so much, Claire. It looks like um, we've, we've given some information at the moment and people may need a, a little bit of time to take that away and digest it perhaps. But what I've noticed is that Lauren's put um, the direct email through to yourself at the Wellbeing Network in the chat bar. So if anybody does have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact Claire. What we've also got in the um, the chat bar is a link through to all of the resources that were on that page, and we will make sure that the um, the slides for pre uh, for Claire's presentation will go out to um, attendees today. Um, but at this stage, it seems like we don't have any further questions. So I'll thank you so so much, Claire, for for your really excellent session. Thank you. You're welcome. And is it okay if I stay for the next? For that five minute please do I'd love to thank you please please do so um moving on what um 
what we've done is we've scheduled a five minute timeout for some restorative practice. Now, um, we've, we talk about talking, we talk about eating, we talk about moving, we talk about um, taking time out. But what we, um, what we don't always talk about is the power of touch. And actually, what, one of the things that the isolation has um, done over the last two years is it has increased the distance between ourselves and those people that we would normally have um, an element of, of touch. And as human beings, it's so important that we, we do make physical contact with others. Now, obviously, there are some people who like a lot of physical contact and there are others who don't, don't like very much at all. But um, in general, things like handshakes, kutches, small gestures, they nourish our bodies, they nourish our minds, they nourish our emotional selves. Now touch can be um, a really challenging modality to use and part of the reason why I've raised it today is because of that. Um, we don't always talk about it because sometimes it makes us very uncomfortable. Because there is such a different level of comfort for each individual around using touch and being touched, um, I wanted to use an activity that you could use with yourself. So at least I would assume you understand what your own comfort level is around, around physical contact. Um, but also it gives you another tool that you can add to your restorative toolkit, either for yourself, either when you're, you're working with somebody else, whether that be a colleague, a friend, a family member, or somebody who accesses your services. Touch can be um, a wonderful alternative to breathing exercises and to guided imagery exercises, especially if um, you don't feel like you have the energy to focus or, or the concentration. Um, and especially for those of us who are more sort of inclined to live in our bodies rather than in our imaginations, touch can be so, so powerful. What I would like to do today is just spend a couple of minutes going through a routine or a technique that's really versatile. It's something that we used to use in clinical practice. You can use it anywhere in your body, but thinking about how much um, our hands are getting dry with the cold weather, constant washing, alka gel, all of that sort of stuff. Sometimes it's really helpful to do when you're moisturizing and just taking that moment out to, to I guess, invest a little bit in, um, in your hands. So when I was taught this technique, I was taught about using it on my face. Not everybody is comfortable with having their face touched, but this is entirely up to you. So at the moment, we're going to talk it through on your hands. If you would prefer to use your face, that's fine. If you have a particular thing about knees or feet, please do whatever it is that makes you comfortable and you think would be helpful for you. So to start with, I'm going to ask you just to focus on where you're sitting. Notice where your skin, where the back of your legs, your back, uh, where they touch the seat that's supporting you. If you're standing, think about how your feet are grounded in the floor. Close your eyes. This is just about you. And I want you to draw your attention to your breathing. Don't try and control your breathing. Just watch it. Just observe it. To start, just move the fingertips of one hand really gently over the skin of the other. It doesn't matter which hand you start with. It doesn't matter what pattern you use. Just keep the touch very light and really slow. This is a moment where you can re-familiarize yourself with your hands. They are one of your most frequently used tools. They deserve your care and attention.
Now I'm going to ask you to, to try and draw your attention to the skin on the hand that's being touched. Notice what it feels. Think about the pressure. The temperature. Perhaps sensitivity. While you keep your focus in the skin of the hand being touched, just take a moment to touch both hands, front, back, fingers, palms, wrists. Now I'm going to ask you to shift your perception. Instead of thinking about the skin that's being touched, think about the fingertips that are doing the touching. Think about the sensations that your fingers are telling you that they are feeling. Notice the shape of your hands, the lumps, the bumps, the soft stuff, the hard stuff. Notice the texture of your hands. How does it change as you move your fingers over different parts of your hand? In a moment, the exercise will come to an end and I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. To take this last moment to move your fingertips over your hands one last time. The ability to, sh to consciously shift your sensory perception between the area being touched and the area doing the touching can be a really effective tool for supporting your body's response to stimulus. Now it's time to draw your attention to your breathing. Again, don't try and control it, just observe it. And when you're ready, please open your eyes. I don't know about anybody else, but what I learned from that is that I need to invest a little bit more love and care in my hands because they feel like sandpaper at the moment. So thank you all so, so much. I could see if I could see so many people spending that time. It's such a simple exercise and sometimes simple, the, the simplest, easiest things to do can be so, so helpful. So thank you so much. We now have our last, our last topic for the session. And we have a presentation by Dr. Jan Burke, who is a research occupational therapist with the Wellbeing Through Work Service in Swansea Bay University Health Board. Unfortunately, Jan wasn't able to join us in person today. However, she has sent us this following, this following message. Hello everyone and Happy New Year. I'm Jan Burke and I'm a research occupational therapist in the Wellbeing Through Work team in Swansea Bay University Health Board. Uh, sorry I can't be there in person today, but I've been asked to give a short presentation about some work that's been going on around the AHP Health and Work Report. Thanks very much for inviting me to talk about the work today. I've just prepared a short presentation, so um, if you'll bear with me, I'll share that on screen now. 
um, and I'll just run through it quickly, it shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes to run through it. So hopefully you can see that now. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was a community of practice that uh, we've set up and that I lead um, around the AHP Health and Work Report. Uh, the community of practice is an informal group of people who've got an interest in uh, the use of the report and perhaps encouraging its use um, a, a bit further. So at the moment we have just over 20 members in our group. We have 17 occupational therapists uh, working in various settings within primary and secondary care across Wales. And we have three physiotherapists, uh, two working in primary care and one from our own uh, Swansea Bay uh, staff wellbeing service. And then we have colleagues from HEIW, in particular Versha, who has been extremely helpful and has attended regularly, so thanks Versha for your input. And then Kerry Phipps, the AHP lead for primary and community care, has also attended when she can. Uh, so we've got quite a nice group together, but we're always uh, looking for other members. So if anyone's interested in joining, just uh, email me, I'll put my email address on at the end of the presentation and I can put you on the circulation list and start inviting you to meetings. So the community really, as I said, it's an informal group of people with an interest in, in the report. We have meetings about every two months or so, there's no particular set schedule uh, via Microsoft Teams. So far we've had four meetings in total to date throughout the course of last year and members in, the, in each meeting, we, we, we discuss the practicalities of using the report. We have a mixture of experience within the group, so some of the members have quite extensive experience of using the report, been using it for quite a while, have got quite a lot of uh, knowledge and experience to share, while others haven't used it yet but are, are interested in starting to use it. So of course there's some really good learning opportunities for them by, by just uh, being able to ask questions of, of people with a bit more experience and, and hear from them. We've been able to talk about what some of the barriers are, some of the obstacles that people have experienced in, in trying to use the report and then some of the things that have, that have eased the way. And uh, we also, last session, we uh, shared, there was some opportunities for sharing examples of completed reports. So some of the members with, with experience of using the report very kindly shared sort of um, anonymised versions of reports that they've completed in the past to give others an idea of the sorts of things that uh, that they're writing on the reports and the sorts of circumstances where they're, they're using it. And in terms of outputs, I think mainly we've we've developed a support network really. We've, we've got that opportunity for peer support, for sharing experience and for sharing resources as well. So for instance, there's been some really nice sharing of um, online training resources that are out there and other bits of information. We've also been able to do a bit of problem solving, so we've identified that there is a lack of confidence among some AHPs about using the report. Um, other issues that have, that have cropped up, um, you know, kind of repeatedly have been issues about acceptability of the report to employers and employers' attitudes to it, and unfortunately some employers still are reluctant to accept a report that isn't a GP fit note um, as such, and, you know, again, experienced members in the group have been able to say what has helped to overcome some of those, those barriers. And other little sort of technical issues about the electronic version of the report that have uh, cropped up and um, we've, we've talked about. Um, and then in terms of the, that lack of confidence, I, that, that did seem to be a recurring theme throughout the meetings. And as a result of that, we've now been offered um, a trial workshop uh, which is going to be taking place on the 28th of this month. This will be run by Cathy Roberts, who's the Education Officer in ACPO, so the Association of Chartered Physiotherapists in Occupational Health. Cathy was instrumental in developing the um, training, the online training that's available via the CSP website in using the AHP Health and Work Report, and she's run workshops for mainly for physiotherapists but um, she has run, run, run at least one for a um, multidisciplinary group. And she's going to sort of adapt her, her workshop a little bit uh, 
with a view to uh, the people in our community, so the, our community of practice, uh, being able to attend that on the 28th and then give feedback and um, give, give kind of information about whether there's anything else that they'd like included or anything they'd like to, to be changed or or removed. So that that then is with a view to the workshop being rolled out um, more widely and made available um, to uh, AHPs in general who might be interested in, in starting to use the AHP report. Uh, so Cathy has very generously let uh, letting us have that trial workshop free of charge. So um, that we're really grateful to Cathy for, for making that offer. And then as well as that, uh, we are grateful to HEIW as well, who have also suggested that they may be able to um, host a repository of resources on their website relating to the AHP report, which again would mean that there's an ongoing sort of repository of information for AHPs to access. And um, there are, I should say, there are other training courses and information available out there, but this it was felt this is perhaps would um, kind of kickstart people into using the report a bit more often, or at all in some cases. Um, so that in a nutshell is what the the community of practice is about. As I say, it's an informal group of AHPs, just with an interest mixture of members, some some with quite a lot of experience using the report, some with none at all who'd like to start using it. If anyone who's listening today is interested in joining that community, as I said before, if you drop me a, an email, I'll be able to add you to the circulation list and invite you to future meetings all very informal, you know, if you aren't able to attend a particular meeting, that's there's no, no problem. Um, and yeah, we can take it from there. So if anyone's interested in, in joining, there's my address. So thanks everyone for listening. I hope that's just given you a quick, uh, a quick update on what the community of practice is all about. Hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thanks and bye bye. Oh, thank you, Jan. It was such a shame she couldn't join us today. Now, we have we have come to time, but before we leave you, we've got a, a couple of Mentimeter questions to, to finish on, and these will give us a little bit more information about how we structure our sessions in the future. Um, so, Lauren, can I ask you to share those again for us? Wonderful. Yes, yeah, so they should be up now. I'll just copy and paste the Mentimeter join-in instructions in case anyone joined after the first session. Okay, and can we have the next question, please? If you haven't yet submitted your answer, please continue to do so as so we just move on to the second question. Give it another 10 or 15 seconds to let people get their answers in. Very interesting. For, for those people who feel that there would be um, more more required to, to raise your confidence around using the tools and resources that we've talked about today, please don't hesitate to contact um, either the speakers directly in relation to the content or the AHP program team so that we can try and signpost you to the most appropriate person who can answer your questions. But thank you so, so much for, for your being so candid in your responses. Um, one one or two last few little messages from me before we, we finally sign off and wish you well for the rest of your day. So please keep an eye out on our web page um, and social media for information regarding our upcoming conference. It's going to be held very differently this year. So instead of having a full day or a couple of days event which we would have loved to have done, what we're going to be doing is scheduling an hour a day over 13 days, starting on the 23rd of February, running through until the 11th of March. Um, there's also going to be a range of interactive activities and exercises um, hosted on the AHP webpage that will um, go alongside those, those um, virtual sessions. So in the chat bar, we'll add a link so that you can share your thoughts about how you would describe your profession to somebody new. And also, if you would like to share a memorable moment from your career as an AHP. Now, the examples that we receive from um, through this link, thank you so much, Abby, 
the examples we receive we, will be used to inform um, some of the conference sessions, but they're also going to be used to help um, with some of our, our professional promotional work, because one of the, the key activities that we're trying to do at the moment is um, trying to raise awareness of who we are, where we are, and what it is that we do, because I think AHPs are so special and, and so diverse that not everybody knows about us yet. So it, it leaves me then just to thank you all for joining us today. Please continue to take care of yourselves, continue to take care of your teams and colleagues, and certainly continue to do all of the absolutely wonderful stuff that you're doing for the people of Wales. We can say no more than thank you, and we hope you look after yourselves. So take care and thanks for joining us.